Hello and welcome to another video from our diversity and inclusion short input series. My name is Nina Kiel and I'm the head of diversity and inclusion at Flying Sheep Studios in Cologne. Now, in case you missed the introductory talk on why you should care about diversity and inclusion, please make sure to check it out first. You'll find the link in the description below. Today, we're going to talk about a very difficult and complex topic. And before we start, I'd actually like to mention a couple of content warnings because of that. We're going to talk about hate, violence and conspiracy theories. So again, it's a difficult topic, but it's necessary to talk about this because it's also a very pressing issue that becomes more relevant each day and it might affect some of your employees or colleagues. So let's talk about transphobia and stochastic terrorism. Now to first iterate what trans or transgender means. Trans people are people whose identity does not align with what they have been assigned at birth. That means a trans woman is someone who was assigned male at birth, but is actually a woman. And a trans man is someone who is assigned female at birth. Non-binary and gender fluid people can fall under this trans umbrella as well, because after all, they also don't identify with what they have been assigned at birth. Now, especially in recent years, trans people and especially trans women have increasingly become targets of harassment, of hate, violence and even harmful legislation. And that is for no other reason than existing or existing in public spaces. Next, I'd like to go through the most commonly used talking points or rather misconceptions, which are often used to justify all of this. First, there's the safe spaces argument or talking point. In this context, trans women are framed as predators and as inherently dangerous because according to this line of thinking, they're actually men who play dress up to get into women's spaces and harass women. And this talking point is actually very easily refuted because if just dressing up as a woman really was a viable way to get into these spaces and harass women, it would have been done already. But there are just a handful of documented cases. And in spaces where you actually have to present any kind of ID, it's even less likely that someone will use this option because they would have to get through a long and strenuous process of psychiatric evaluations and tests before that trans identity was officially approved. So it does not make any sense to choose this approach because it's too stressful and time consuming. And honestly, hundreds of years of experience have shown that harassers and rapists will find plenty of opportunities to enact violence against women without doing any of the above. And as recent cases have shown, it's actually much more likely that trans women become victims of violence in these spaces instead of being the perpetrators, especially in restrooms. Now, the next common talking point is the think of the children talking point. Again, in this case, Trans women in particular are called predatory for grooming children and for forced sexualizing them. Also, there's this talking point of infectious transgenderism, which suggests that being trans is actually like an infection. If you are a trans person and you are present in public, then people seeing you will be infected by your transgenderism. And this is complete nonsense and it links back to con old conspiracy theories which have also been used, for example, in the context of Jews. Now, the supposed evidence for that is that today many more people come out as trans than it was the case even a couple of years ago. But the reason is, in fact, that trans identities are just less oppressed. There's more freedom for individual expression nowadays and more opportunities to share information about trans identity. So it's much more likely that people will get that information and realize that they are trans, which they have been all along. Another common accusation is that 
healthcare providers are destroying the lives of young people by forcing them to have invasive surgeries that could potentially ruin their lives. But in fact, in most countries, these invasive surgeries are not performed on minors ever. And puberty blockers are provided after long and careful evaluations, even though their effects are reversible because they don't change the body, but they prevent change to give young people a chance to think about transitioning without actually transitioning. So it's helpful for people to consider more carefully. Despite all of this, the think of the children talking point is an incredibly useful one because it causes immediate emotional reactions And it's difficult to speak up against because, after all, most people can agree that children should be protected, right? And it's the main reason that an increasing number of people support trans-exclusionary legislation or even violence, because it seems justified if it's there to protect innocent and weak human beings. But I'd like to point out that the same people who feverishly argue that trans people endanger children just by existing very often do not speak up when children become actual victims of sexual abuse. Okay, now that we covered the most common talking points, let's have a look at how they are being used and for what purposes. This is where the term stochastic terrorism comes in, which would be defined as the public demonization of a person or group resulting in the incitement of a violent act which is statistically provable, but whose specifics cannot be predicted. So while certain statements don't openly call for acts of violence, they do increase the likelihood of violence occurring later. To further elaborate on this, right-wing media personalities like, for example, Tucker Carlson or Matt Walsh have perfected this strategy because they do not ask their fans directly to perform acts of violence, but they usually share personal information of trans people and their allies. They mention clinics that offer healthcare support for trans people. And then they simply say, don't you want to make sure this ends and that children are safe again? Or for example, if I were you, I tell these people what I think of their horrible practices. And while they are not specifying what these actions could be, these statements inevitably lead to bomb threats against clinics, death threats against people, or actual violence that is enacted against individuals. Because these call to actions follow months of constant misrepresentation of trans people as degenerates and sexual predators and of doctors as people who mutilate children. And this is also where people like J.K. Rowling come in, whose comments, or at least some of them, seem innocuous at first glance, but who consciously taps into this climate of fear and hate, and overtly so with this particular statement. So so Rowling knows very well that she has an enormous influence over many people because they like her work and she has a huge platform. And she knows that some of her followers are very receptive to transphobic ideas. And she openly supports individuals and organizations who campaign for removing trans people's rights. Next, I'd like to share the reasons for people to share these conspiracy theories and to try to incite violence. Now, for right-wing politicians, it's that they can enact power and pass laws that otherwise wouldn't have a chance to be considered. Because very often, Anti-trans legislation actually helps enforce strict gender roles, for example, by prohibiting people to wear clothes that don't conform with their gender or sex. They can strip queer people of their rights and remove them from public life, or at least attempt to remove them. And they can control people's and especially women's bodies. Now, so much legislation has been passed just this year that it's impossible to go through all examples or even just a couple of examples without making this talk incredibly long. So instead, I'd like to just recommend that you check out the website translegislation.com, which actually tracks those bills. And these are not the most recent numbers, by the way. There have been more bills that have been passed or discussed at least.
Now, politicians using this opportunity to gain more power makes sense, right? Because they can create fear and use it to pass laws, which they have been doing in the past as well with other kind of minority groups that they targeted. But what about, for example, transphobic feminists? Interestingly for women and other queer people, it's also about power. Their motivation is power because by putting the target on another marginalized groups, they can basically direct the attention away from themselves and feel safer because now they are not the most likely victims anymore. Trans people are, or at least that's what they think. And for the same reason, trans exclusionary radical feminists and also some queers openly support right wing and even fascist ideas and the people and groups who share them. Because if these potential perpetrators of violence are your allies, then you don't have to fear them as much. But I'd like to point out, and that's very important, that this is just in theory. It's actually a false sense of security because the minute that fascists are done with trans people in one way or another, they will turn their back on cis women and transgender excluding queers and target these groups again. Another common motivator for feminists, women, queers, is that they finally get to be the bullies, sometimes for the first time in their lives. Because people who have historically or personally experienced oppression, hate and maybe even violence, finally have climbed up the ladder of a really terrible hierarchy and they get the chance to kick down for the first time. And by the way, these two are also often the reasons why white women turn against people of color, because they get to be part of the elite or powerful group who stands above another and they want to stay there. So they are absolutely willing to hurt others to cling to this fleeting power. To end this talk, I would like to tell you why you should care about this and also act. Now, first, it's because Obviously, I hope it's the moral thing to do to support and protect a group of people who become targets of hate and violence. But you should also care if you are a cis woman or if you have a mother, sister, daughter or any other relatives and friends who are cis women. Because most of the legislation targeting trans women would also or already do affect all women, especially the so-called bathroom bills and regulations around sports. Because if entry to women's toilets is granted based on a very specific and narrow idea of femininity, then women who have some masculine features like a deep voice or a chiseled chin might be targets of at least intense scrutiny or maybe even experience violence when they just want to use the bathroom. And in the context of sports, people are actually suggesting to examine children's genitals before they are allowed to enter sports teams or competitions. And that is a highly intrusive and potentially traumatizing experience for everyone who has to go through it, especially at an early age. It's not trans people who are a threat. It's the people inciting hate against them to enforce their ideologies, their very narrow ideas of who should be allowed to exist and how. So I really encourage you to not only educate yourself on this topic further, but also to speak up about it. So for example, when you encounter transphobic talking points at your workplace, if you want to ensure diversity and inclusion at your company, then supporting and protecting trans people is a very important step in the process. So I'd like to thank you for listening to this talk. Thank you for educating yourself. And if you want to learn more about this topic, make sure to check out the resources, which as always, I've linked below. Thank you so much and see you next time.